It's usually the Wittgenstein, more than anybody else, practically, in, in recent philosophy, was impressed by the idea that our language has the meaning we give it. It has the language, it has the meaning which is derived from the way it's taught and is implicit in the way it's taught, and it can't reach out uh, beyond the ways in which we are introduced to it. And he combined that also with a very radical and a very interesting set of reflections about the ways in which a practice or rule which has already been acquired can or can't bind you for the future. He saw that there was something mysterious about the idea of saying, as we do when we teach some rule of behavior, because you've done so and so up to this point, you must do yes. so and so in this next situation. He said, why am I not free? Yes. And would constantly come back to the thought that we found one way of continuing a practice, one way of developing a institution or so on, the necessary or obvious way to come back to the, the idea that this was an anthropological fact. Mm -hmm. It's a fact about human nature, or it might not even be, because he didn't really distinguish very much between, as it were, a psychological and an anthropological level here. Uh, it might even be a property of the group, not necessarily of humanity. A form, a form of life. A, a form of life. And Wittgenstein's famous equation of a language with a form of life I think enabled a form of life to be, in principle at least, one of a small group of people, of a tribe, a favorite example of it, or indeed of humanity. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some of his propositions seem to be relative to humanity. But um, I must say, Wittgenstein never does what both Hume and Kant in different ways did try to do, which was to show exactly to what certain of these propositions were. Relative. I mean, Hume was very keen on trying to show that certain sorts of ways we had of going on were relative to the fact that we were human beings. Yes, yes. Kant was concerned for showing that various ways we had of going on were relative to the fact that we were something slightly more general, um, relative to something slightly more general than human beings, namely creatures who found out about the universe serially through some kind of sensation. But Wittgenstein, uh, opposed to theory, doesn't do that. He says, just look at what we do. Mm -hmm. Now, this means that in some at least in its more parodial forms. I think the Wittgenstein himself that's often avoided this, but more parodial, it does lead to some extraordinarily odd results, doesn't it? Because it means that, in the end, they can't really be wrong if the thing is a going concern. I mean, let's take the... the well, all you can be wrong about, according to Wittgenstein, was, was in one's interpretation of what one is doing. I mean, he thought people were wrong to suppose that there were uh, inner processes. That's right, you had the wrong picture. You had the wrong picture, yes. You had the wrong picture. But, so the, but you had the wrong picture of your own behavior in a certain sense. You could have a wrong picture of your own behavior, but, yes. but that meant that every, and perhaps this is a very important idea in Wittgenstein, mm -hmm. that every fundamental form of learning yes. uh, uh, in regard to anything like philosophical learning would necessarily be a piece of self-understanding. And I, uh, this is what many people have found, as it were, the Socratic or almost mm -hmm. existentialist yes. element in Wittgenstein, that what we come to understand when we see we were wrong was some sense in which we've deceived or misled ourselves. Well, about a narrow part of ourselves, I mean, misled about our use of language, in fact, but uh, not misled about our characters or... or well, our, that I think is not altogether stuff. clear, because while indeed Wittgenstein tends to say always that what we are mistaken about is the nature of our language, yes. his concept of our language is so generous Yes, that to be mistaken yes. about our language is to be mistaken yes. about our form of life. And therefore it's a way to have a wrong picture of what one is oneself fundamentally at. I think like everybody else who's working in philosophy now and has been brought up in this tradition, yes. it would be preposterous and wrong to deny that one had been influenced oh, very much by this work. I mean, it's been... Even if any negatively. Partly because of the enormous imaginative power. Yes. I mean, there's the, the, yes. such enormous... Well, it's a great literary achievement. Yes, it's a literary philosophy. I mean, it's, of course, it's tremendous part of the British tradition always to oppose those two thoughts. Yes. yes. I mean, it's, uh, uh, for instance, the case of a writer like Nietzsche, to whom, yes, yes. of course, Wittgenstein bears a very strong resemblance in a lot of ways. The literary and the philosophical achievement are not totally distinct from one. From well, one well one let's one take one. it in a concrete case. Let's, 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 point, let's yeah. take the implications many people have drawn from Wittgenstein, and whether he himself would have approved of them, for relig religious yes. discourse. I mean, as I understand it, the idea is that uh, religious language is, again, its own form of life with its own criteria, consists in carrying out certain, certain practices, and it can't be criticized. Now, um, well, I think that's probably a bit 
Oh, there's something up yes. that street. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, yes. it could approach in two ways. Yes. I mean, um, one much more comforting to a, to a religious person than the other. It can be said it's true in its own terms, or it can be said the question of truth or falsehood doesn't rely, arise in relation to it. It's simply a form of ritual, uh, and then the only question is whether the ritual is carried out properly or whether it, it fulfills its, um, um, it, its function, its... its um, emotional function or whatever. Oh, yes, now, I, the, the yes. second would be, would be discouraging, but the first, if we say it's true in its own terms, um, would have... Well, it. if one's being very Wittgensteinian about it, I mean, if one's being very Wittgensteinian, I'm sure he wouldn't say either of those things. Because um, to say it's true in its own terms sounds frightfully sniffy. I mean, as if to imply it isn't true, really. <laughs> and it isn't either true or false. It would be a kind of meta-remark that would be standing outside the whole game. I and mean, he would say, rather, what are they at when yes. they say it's true? I mean, I think actually, as I think Dummett once remarked, the concept of truth plays an extraordinarily small part yes. in the later philosophy of Wittgenstein. Meaning is not connected with truth in the later philosophy of Wittgenstein. Meaning is, co is connected with going on. I mean, yes. it's connected with assent, not with truth. What you discover what the proposition means is to discover what elicits assent from the group, I think, rather than trying to transcend the whole practice to some notion of truth conditions, I think. Of course, Wittgenstein was prepared to say these sentences, these propositions, get their meaning from the form of life in which they're embedded. Well, the form of life certainly exists. And they're yeah. going on in this way is what it is to come to understand what yeah. these religious propositions mean. But of course, for the believers, and I'm not here quoting Wittgenstein, but one's bound to say this oneself, and it's for the believers, their meaning was supposed to transcend these situations well, in which they practiced in this way. It seems to be very odd, because this seems to be to sever meaning from truth. Yes, but I think that that's what Wittgenstein's theory of language tends to do. I mean, I think they're about acceptance conditions, conditions in which other people will say yes, rather than some, as it were, independently conceived truth but conditions. Do you think that uh, he thought the question of truth couldn't be raised with regard to these propositions, or just that he wasn't interesting to raise it? I think he thought that it meant something else in regard to these propositions. Well, this is what I meant by saying earlier, he represented these, them as being true in their own terms. Yes, but true in their own terms would mean there's some way of their counting as true, mm -hmm. yes. But in this case, it seems to be so difficult for him or his supporters to say that the picture that so many of the earlier believers had, namely of a reality distinct from them and this world yes. to which these propositions correspond or fail to correspond, so difficult for the Wittgensteinians to say that this was just a wrong picture. Or, let me put it this way, if this was a wrong picture, what it shows is wrong is religion, not a certain interpretation yes. of religion. I mean, that's the point, isn't it? In this case, you couldn't say religion and all the meaning of religion really exists, but it exists in the practices of this world. Any picture of it corresponding to a transcendental reality is just a false picture, because it was the point of those practices to correspond to a transcendental world. So once you're persuaded that the idea of it corresponding to a transcendental world is nonsense, then what you do is stop engaging in the practices. 